Welcome. This is what is happening on the sun today, the 13th of October 2011. The string of sea flares has continued overnight. But before we find out why that's occurring, let's deal with our trivia question. It was on this date that Greenwich was determined to be the zero longitude for universal time. In what year did it happen? The answer will be given at the end. We've had eight sea flares since we met yesterday. They've ranged in intensity from mid-sea level to C1. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye as I'm putting this together that another sea flare has just occurred. So let's see why this is happening by taking a look at the active regions. We have nine officially numbered regions on the disk at the moment, which means we added two overnight, which were the two that I pointed out that were unnumbered yesterday. And we've lost none of our existing regions. Region 1309 in the northwest comprises mainly of a large single spot. However, overnight it may have gained a few tiny small satellite spots. However, I don't think it's going to amount to much because shortly it's going to go over the northwest limb. So let's start with regions 1312, 1315 and 1318, just past this centre in the northwest. Region 1312 doesn't seem to have changed a great deal since yesterday. Region 1315 has decayed quite a bit. And as predicted, the newly numbered region, region 1318, has grown quite significantly. However, I think that growth has stalled and it probably will start to fade shortly. There are some hints in the magnetogram and in the plage that there may be some more spots coming up trailing this region, but we'll have to wait for a day or two to see if that in fact is the case. Region 1314 in the northeast seems fairly stable, however it is supposed to have produced a couple of other sea flares that we've seen. The other newly numbered region, region 1319, is also in the northeast but much closer to the equator. It has grown quite a bit overnight and has produced five of the sea flares that we've seen. Region 1313 in the southwest also doesn't seem to have changed very much in the last 24 hours. Region 1317 in the southeast uh, has not changed a great deal, it remains a single spot. So let's move on to region 1316. Now this region has shown quite a bit of growth, particularly in the trailer part of the region, in the last 24 hours. And it's surprising that it has not produced any flares. Let's contrast and compare regions 1316 and 1319. Region 1316 has very large spots and is growing rapidly, yet hasn't produced any flares. Region 1319 is a small region with quite a few spots, but they're all relatively small, but has produced five sea flares. Why the difference? Maybe the difference can provide us with a clue as to uh, how to forecast flares. If you look at region 1316, you first must ignore some of the apparent structure. Some of the positive polarity mixed in with the negative and some of the negative polarity mixed in with the positive is a, a foreshortening effect. And if you want more details on that, see my video on uh, negative sunspots, which I'll leave a uh, link to in the description box below. If you ignore those areas, then you can draw a very simple demarcation line between the positive area and the negative area. So there's what is called a simple neutral line. However, if we look at the equivalent for region 1319, we see that the uh, positive and negative is all mixed up. This is what is called a complex neutral line. And it's this that's producing the flares. With all the magnetic field mixed up with one another, then there's much more opportunity for them to uh, interact and cause a flare. So over the last six months, I think we've identified five factors to look for to try to predict a flare. First, you have to have strong magnetic fields, i.e. sunspots. If there are new sunspots that are rapidly emerging, or the resisting sunspots are growing rapidly, then there's a good chance of a flare. Also, if the spots are moving around, there's a, uh, a chance of, of getting a flare. Now we've added a fifth one, that the magnetic field should be complicated. These are the factors that I look for when I'm trying to decide whether a region is going to flare or not. Now, as I usually would say, that we will look at the continuous evolution of these regions using the magnetic and um, sunspot data from the HMI instrument. However, you'll see very shortly that there's a problem with this. It's quite fun, but not very helpful from a scientific point of view. I'm sure it's going to get the conspiracy theorists dreaming up all sorts of weird scenarios about UFOs tumbling the spacecraft or something. Now we have a little bit more than we had recently of the AIA data. And there's some really interesting things going on there. There's a lovely jet coming from the northeastern quadrant of the sun, and we see a filament eruption off of the northwest. I've created a couple of videos of these two events. The first one is a um, filament eruption that travels almost from the center of the sun to the north limb. 
and so it's huge but very faint. I've got an arrow here to show you where it was. There's a second type of jet that is occurring actually in the region itself and this is a confined jet. You can see the material flow from the base of the, the loop all the way along the loop to the other end. The second event is a prominence eruption off the northwest limb. You may recall some months ago we were talking about the signs for trying to see when a prominence will erupt and create a coronal mass ejection. And here's a classic example of that where a prominence starts to rise, become very dynamic and then suddenly lift off. So from both of these events we would expect a coronal mass ejection. In a few minutes we'll take a look at the SOHO data and see if we're right. But first let's take a look at the low temperature coronal movie and compare the relative um, variability of each of the regions. In the high temperature coronal image from the SXI instrument, we can see that that coronal hole now literally stretches from pole to pole and there's almost no chance that the high speed solar wind stream will miss us. So in three, maybe four days time, we should expect solar wind velocities to increase as a result of this particular structure. There also seems to be some hint of something coming over the northeast limb and a bright area coming over the southeast limb, but very small. As I mentioned earlier, those two eruptions should have produced coronal mass ejections. And when we look at the SOHO data, indeed we can see that there have been two eruptions, one off the northeast and one off the northwest. It is interesting that they are almost simultaneous. I wonder if they're connected in any way. Solar wind data shows us that the temperature of the solar wind has remained remarkably constant while the velocity has decayed somewhat and the density has fluctuated between 0.1 and 1 protons per cubic centimeter. The high energy electron flux at geosynchronous altitudes remains at fairly nominal levels and we still have not had a proton event. The auroral zone seems a bit more quiet than it was yesterday. However, the KP index has been varying between 1 and 3, which is a slight increase over yesterday. But NOAA has issued no space weather warnings in the last 24 hours. So in summary then, the X-ray background is at the B4 level. Sunspot number is increased to 150. Radio sun intensity is at 130 solar flux units. Solar wind speed has dropped back to 360 kilometers per second with a density of about one proton per cubic centimeter. And geospace conditions are rated as quiet. So my forecast for the next 24 hours is that C flares are likely, M flares are possible, but X flares are quite unlikely. The sunspot number will remain high. Coronal mass ejections remain likely. The solar wind speed will remain low. And geomagnetic storms are unlikely. The composite coronal image shows us that we have regions in both the northern and southern hemisphere behind the east limb ready to come over in the next couple of days. The answer to the trivia question was that Greenwich was made the reference uh, longitude for universal time in 1884. Now that surprised me because it seemed awfully late. I thought it was much more likely in the 18th century. Anyway, that's it for today. Keep safe. Bye for now.